It's the Powerhouse Woman Show. You're a powerhouse woman, successful, accomplished, but you know the time has come for something else. To pivot, make a shift, or do what you've been putting off for a long time. I'm Monica Pierre, a media entrepreneur, Emmy Award winning journalist and coach, and I'm on a mission to help you figure out your path forward and create powerful new stories about your life and legacy. There's more ahead. Time to do the greatest work of your life. Hello and welcome once again to the Powerhouse Woman Show. Hello, Powerhouse Woman. If you were in charge or someone asked you, well, what would you create in the workplace? How would it change? How would it be different? How would it be more in tune with the spirit of who you are and the people who report to you or the people you manage? We're going to talk about the spirit of work on the Powerhouse Show, and we're delighted joining us all the way from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, is Dr. Marie Gravet, and she is a transformative leadership coach, also a podcaster, CEO of Shift Management Inc., and the highly talked about book that was released this year, The Spirit of Work and for a Happier and More Productive Workplace. And I've had the honor of connecting with her and being uh, on her podcast. Can't wait for that to be released. Marie, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me, Monica. I'm honored to be here. Oh, amazing. I, I told you before, and I'll share with my audience, I just think that we just connect. I don't know how, I don't know why, who's questioning it, go with it, don't overthink it, but uh, loving the fact that I will, I can be in your world and in your sphere coming up. So when we talk about work, and I've worked a long time, I've worked in media, and that can be an interesting place to work, but I always felt that sometimes for many of us, we had to leave our spirit at the door and not enter fully as who you are. When you walk up, talk about the spirit of work, what are you talking about exactly? Well, I, I'm talking about people coming to work as their whole selves. So with a heart, a mind, a body, and a soul, and in community. So people all belong to community, whether they're aware of it or not, and they belong to different cultures. Um, and they can be, you know, groups that they, they grew up with, uh, if, that they may or have not questioned. And so their beliefs from those groups, they're bringing with them to work. So thinking about that um, and placing yourself in a, in, in a position of you have agency to promote equity, if you choose to do so, uh, uh, is part of this spirit of work. So it's the purposeful work. It's work mm -hmm. with integrity. It's work in the context of being a member of the human race. And it's also what could workplaces be like? What would the future of workplace wellness be like if we could truly live wholly? That would be amazing. And I know we all have some experiences, whether we worked for someone else or we were the manager or the owner or whether we were independent and an entrepreneur and worked for someone else. What are some of your earlier memories of work and that maybe not have felt good, but you couldn't process it at the time? And I know you started off young working, particularly as what, a dishwasher? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any, uh huh, like what the heck moments did you have when you worked? There? Oh, yeah, I had lots of them. Uh, so I like stories and I like to reflect on the meaning of those stories over time. So, yes, I have no trouble accessing the stories that when I was 13, I was working as a dishwasher in an institution, and um, it was a trading institution, and they um, so they, I, there were events and I, I worked there where I would have to, you know, pick up the dishes. There was really, it was really heavy work for a 12, 13 year old to do. Um, and, uh, yeah, the two things that I remember was first off how, um, messy people were in the event because they expected the under underlings like me to pick up after them and how I felt that was just so unfair and not that I wasn't, I was prepared and did the work, but I just thought the attitude of, you know, um, condescension was was hard to take. Uh, and uh, then the other thing that came that from that particular experience was that the people who I worked with around me, as soon as I walked in said, are you in high school? And I went, yes. 
uh, going to high school, you know, so they said, well, if you're uh, when you're in high school, what are you going to, to take? Are you going to graduate from high school? And I went, uh, yeah, like I was just like, how? why would I graduate from why high school? Why would I go? <laughs> went, well, none of us have graduated from high school. So just remember that. So it was like there was this group think and there was like, you don't belong because if you're even thinking about going to high school and graduating, you do not belong to this group. So that was that was my first work experience. It wasn't very pleasant. No, no. So <laughs> as, we, as we do more work and work with others, and even as we ascend up the ladder, how much of those attitudes that we bring in our interaction with someone, the Monica's and the Marie's, based upon how we were treated or what is the group think? Are you asking me what that was like afterwards as I went? Yeah, to or what you afterward and also what you've come to, to understand in, in, in your research. Mm -hmm. about how we bring these things that maybe not have felt so good. Because I would imagine that manager had experienced something similar yeah, in some way or form where she was thinking outside of the group, whether it was not going to high school, but, but something else, maybe kind of thinking you want more than the rest of us want. And do and you bring that? How would she know that? that from looking at a shy 12 year old? Right. Yeah. <laughs> how would she know that? <laughs> <laughs> who's just picking up dishes and <laughs> doing that type of thing. So, uh, you know, so basically, because the people that I have interacted where it didn't feel so spirit filled, it didn't feel so good. It was really more about them and yeah. maybe not as much about me, although it just felt all about me. That's exactly how I felt through most of my work life. Um, and it felt like it was always a, a target uh, that I was being targeted um, for things that I was not expecting to be targeted for. That it was usually a surprise. So the things I expected I could be targeted for, I was prepared for. Um, but the things that I wasn't expecting were, you know, that I was blindsided by, it it felt like it was a personal attack. So, um, and it wasn't about me. So I'll give you another example. So I was a teacher, that was my first uh, professional career. And I was teaching in a junior high school um, I guess you'd call that a middle school in a lot of places now. So I was teaching there and um, I taught uh, several core subjects and also drama. And I had a drama club and they were the, the students were entering into a into a drama festival and they showed up for one rehearsal on um, on an evening and they were just really unruly. And I it, it was awful. You know, they were just really, really awful to each other and awful to me. And I find I lost patience with, with them because I couldn't get them to cooperate at all. And so finally, I yelled at them, "Will you just shut up, right? Now, I would say that that's not a really horrible thing to say, but it was um, it was out of character for me because I didn't ever speak to my students that way. And so one of the students complained uh, to their to to the to their parents that I had sworn at them, which wasn't true. I hadn't. I saw that. And so then the principal called me into the office and said, you know, what did you say exactly? And I, so I, I told him, this is what happened. And this was, you know, we're, we're like three days away from the drama festival and they were just not, not focusing at all. And I, I mean, I have a lot more skills now to help groups focus. I was a good teacher, but I didn't have the emotional awareness skills at that time to be able to really hone into what would have helped that group to settle. But still, um, the principal ca called me in and said, you know, it doesn't, um, it, it, it whatever whatever you do everybody's always watching you and i said well it's not that i want to you know make excuses for me get losing my temper with with the students but i know from my my because i was doing my master's research at the time i know that you know, the gym teacher for example um fondles the girls and that there's swearing going on in multiple classes on a regular basis by other teachers all i did was one slip up and he said, well, because you're a woman, you're a white cheat. And the stain shows up a lot more. Mm. And I was like, what? What are you talking wow. about? And uh, uh, so, yeah. And so then, and, and he said, and don't forget it because I'm watching you. And I thought, this is not about, like, I, at the moment, I was thinking, what the heck is this about? I felt really, de that was demeaning and demoralizing and it was unfair. And um, it was really a very gendered response. Um, and uh, and and I thought, you know, that what you know, this is this is ridiculous. Um, but at the same time, I felt like it was my fault somehow, right? But now, mm -hmm. looking back on it, I thought it was not my fault. And if I would have been confident in myself enough to say, you know, what you're saying is really unfair, and I'm not accepting it, 
men and women should be held to the same standard of professionalism here, you know, but I didn't, I didn't say it. Yes. So, um, oh, yeah. we could go back and say what we really thought we could say and wanted to say and what we would say now. We really, could just go past. back and rewind. <laughs> well, but it, was, we had... it was that feeling that it was my fault, even though it yeah. wasn't, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a feeling that I somehow needed to accept blame for something that had that, you know, that wasn't, wasn't blameworthy. Like, I think it was the, the F telling your students to shut up is not something I'm no, proud no. of, but if mm -hmm. in a career of 17 years, I only do that once is that, that is not really what I would call the worst thing I could possibly do. <laughs> um, yeah. And so being held to an unrealistic standard uh, with men uh, who were actually doing things that, that were, that would be considered uh, not only reprehensible, but would be against the law at this point was, uh, was just such a slap in the face. So that's been a lot of my workplace experiences. I've had some really good work experiences too, but that experience with people who were superior to me um, or when I was in a management position, I would I treated my subordinates for lack of a better world, word with a you know with a lot of um, respect and dignity and collaborated with them on things and ensured that they knew what expectations were so they felt safe um, but my own managers never uh, treated me that way so that I certainly is one of the impetus for writing the book the spirit of work is you know what is what would be a better way to work and um, what do we already know about the way people work from the ancient traditions so I looked at um, uh, the spiritual traditions in the sacred writings of all of the world religions to see what did people have mm. to say about work. And I found amazing, amazing things that if we apply even just one of them, we would have workplaces that are outstanding. So well, what, what are some of those those practices, those ancient beliefs that we could use right now? Well, one of them was came from Hinduism, which is one of the oldest religions in the world. And there are nine principles for how to live correctly and interact with other people. And one of the principles is, is to pack up and complete. And so um, packing up and complete is the idea behind it is that you don't hold on to old stories, that when something's happened, you don't keep staying stuck to that story and saying, you know what, it happened 10 years ago, but I'm still mad about it, right? So that story that I just told you about that principle, packing up and moving on would be to uh, to say, you know, that was his problem at the time. And that was my situation at the time. And we did the best we could. And it's in the past and, I, and I've and i moved on from it. I've forgiven him. And whether he forgives uh, me or has anything to do with me or not, has really no no meaning to me anymore because that was a long time ago. <laughs> right. That was 40 do, years do ago. You, so. Yeah, do you feel it in your body where yeah. you're packing it up you're completing it, you can still talk about it, right? I mean, it came up in the conversation today in the interview, yeah. but you don't feel it in your body anymore. No, the emotion is detached from the story and I don't feel it inside me, like if, if, in, in a corporeal sense. Uh, and I don't feel the rage that I, that I felt uh, at the time, right? So um, that is dissipated. But I think this idea of learning to let go of old stories is not something that I ever heard about when I was growing up or as an adult. I, I would say all of us have worked with people where they people caught like they call it having a chip on their shoulder. But, you know, learning learning to let something go and say, you know, today's a new day. Let's restart this relationship um, that could be so significant for workplaces. So that was that was one of them. Uh, and uh, and and there was an awful lot on the practice of love and of preferring others to yourself, to, to, give, to be altruistic, to, um, to really consider the needs of other people. That, I mean, it's not said in that language, but it, there, were, there was so much about that. So I found many quotes, I found many different things. And then I also found um, sort of spin-offs in the modern day, like for example, a couple of Muslim psychologists who created a personality inventory based on the principles of Islam. And it's so they, it's personality and spirit and how's, how are you in the workplace? And it was absolutely fascinating. I just was amazed by it. So, but, so that was one of the things in the book. The other one was to look at what has, has science discovered about workplace wellness that we are not applying because lots of good stuff's been, been discovered, but it's not being applied. And what would be in the way of applying it? And then we went to business case studies, stories and examples. Um, where people are either have a block and don't get past it and how could they apply the principles or they have gotten past it to a certain extent and how can we celebrate that and replicate it and do it do it more 
So, um, so it has those three lenses. The other thing that I think is useful is that it goes from the individual to the community to the institution. So it's not just, you know, be mindful and practice, um, you know, what can you learn from this experience yourself, which is useful, but that's you. There's also how are you in community and how's community with you? And how are you promoting a sense of community in the workplace? And then there's, which would in, imply not gossiping and backbiting, but rather being helpful and being supportive and encouraging. And then as an institution, how are you supporting uh, and uh, supporting people and making sure that there's balance and that there's justice in the workplace. So um, that, it was really interesting to research, uh, very hard to write, uh, but I think it's it's a read that doesn't, um, doesn't intimidate. Maybe the first ch chapter where you're thinking about sort of the, the big worldview picture could be, but when people read it they, and they get into the stories and the examples, they feel really they identify with a lot of them. What made it hard to write for you? Um, well, I just I started out by just saying, I, I know a lot about this, I'm going to write. Well, that got me one chapter with no, no, um, no references. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, I don't know a lot about this, I have to research it. And then so just going through it, and then checking the references. And, and then also, there were six editors that worked with me on the book. And the last editor was probably the most useful for saying, this quote, probably can't be authenticated because it's not easy to authenticate things that come from four to six thousand years ago right this quote probably can't be authenticated you may need to look at this reference and rethink what you're going to say here or choose a choose a different quote that can be authenticated like that kind of stuff was so picky and it took hours and hours to deal with but um it ended up making it a i i hope a bullet i think it's pretty bulletproof so you know <laughs> <laughs> well you know and sometimes we you know, we're called to put things out into the world. And if we wait until it's bulletproof, then sometimes we just never put anything out into the world. So I applaud yeah. you for putting it yeah. into the world. Yeah. It's also, it, I think that was hard about it was just staying with the discipline of it. And you know, if you never, I have this, I got this thing from an insurance company in the mail yesterday. It says, let me just check. Um, okay. If you don't challenge yourself, you will never know who you could be. So yeah. I said insurance nice? company saying nah, that. Yeah. Nah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. A Canadian insurance company is saying that. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's yeah, no, maybe it's an anom <laughs> anomaly. I've never heard an insurance company say that. I would love to that. receive that. That sounds amazing. If you never mm -hmm. challenge yourself, you know, never know who you could be. And that yeah. seems like a, a really the opposite of what an insurance company would say, which would be be safe and take no risks. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so they, I had to challenge myself, and I so every Monday I, I said my my goal is three thousand words, a, mm -hmm. uh, every week. And sometimes I met it, sometimes I exceeded it, sometimes I got just one paragraph written, and I go, that's all I got. <laughs> right, it's the discipline. I had a yeah. conversation years ago with a coworker on the air, the air, and there was a story about this woman who say she collected pennies. And then over the years, she was able to make a contribution to one of the universities. And he's like, pennies? Oh, I don't even pick those things up. I said, but it's not about the penny. It's about the discipline it is. of doing it. So yeah, so that made me think of that. So I'm glad you were disciplined to do it. <laughs> Get your you book know, completed. this pennies thing really made me think of, have you ever read the book, uh, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn? I know of it. I don't. Rem I guess I read it when I was younger, but uh, yeah, a tree it's grows in really Brooklyn. It's a really beautiful book uh, about you know New York and all the immigrant mm -hmm. communities that moved into to New York and and how how they associated or didn't associate with each other and and how poor how desperately poor they were and how many social problems there were there. And that one thing that stands out from this book for me, uh, there are many things, but one is that they the the mother would they would send the, the children to go and do groceries and they had to buy something that was cheap like day old bread or you know or just about to expire bologna or something like that and then she'd say okay now you saved one penny and so then we're going to put that one penny into and they, they had nailed a can into a closet um and there was a hole in it you couldn't take it up unless you lifted the nail and you so they put one penny in and when the when that can was full they took the pennies out and they used it, speaking of insurance, they used it to start an insurance policy that they were able to use later. And the, just how much vision that took and discipline and, yeah. and, and, and thinking of one penny and how often were they able to, oftentimes they weren't able to, to do that one penny 
you know, so, um, and they have, of course, disasters and things that happened that didn't allow them to save, but they managed to do it over a period of five years. And uh, it's, it's the kind of thing that I think that just the, your penny story made me think of that. Just, yes, yes. I love the penny story. I love mm -hmm. it. I love it as well. So for you, the spirit of work, how, what, how will we know that there's been a shift in work, in community, and for the individual? Um, well, maybe let me just tell you about com some of the models that can be used to get there. And one of them is to think about everything we think, say, and do as being either soul enhancing or soul diminishing. So um, soul enhancing is something that helps people to feel free to, to be who they are. Um, that's encouraging, that promotes learning, that helps, helps people to um, express themselves and be creative. It promotes innovation, it promotes inclusion, and people feel good, right? They feel like they belong. And soul diminishing is things that destroy people, make them feel bad, make them feel like you've dominated, you know, over them or, or you've forced an injustice on them that, that they are suffering from. And that can come from just thinking, uh, thinking a bad thought about somebody. Um, and I actually demonstrated that in one of the talks that I gave a few years ago. I had, and I, and then I re replicated this because it worked really well. But I, you know, with the idea of kinesiology is that you can, if you push down on your hand, you're either strong or you're weak. If it's, um, if it's something that resonates with you, so you can use this with things you might be allergic to to find out if you're allergic to it or not. Um, so I did this kinesiology test with a group of 800 high school students, and then after that, I replicated it in business demonstrations. So I asked a really strong buff guy to come to the front and and test his muscle strength. So he put his his arm up, and then I, you know, tested his muscle strength, and I couldn't push his hand down. And then afterwards, I asked everybody in the room to just think that they disliked him for about 10 seconds. And I said, don't worry, we're going to change this afterwards. But I want you to think that you dislike him. And while they were thinking that, I pushed down on his arm and it went completely weak. And he goes, what's the matter? How come I don't have any strength in my arm? And he could not lift his arm. And then I asked mm. them, now I think this is the most important guy in the school. And I love this guy. I just love him. Same thing, 10 seconds. And his arm was so strong that I could, I hung on it and swung back and forth. <laughs> Right? And yes. everybody burst into applause, right? And they went, wow, that's amazing. I said, that's the power of positive and negative thought. And if you're walking around the school thinking how angry you are, or how much you hate somebody or how much you don't like that teacher, look what it's doing to everybody. It's weakening everyone, right? And when you're thinking, wow, I'm so lucky to be here and how, how, how what a great group of people. Let me just get to know them better. Then you're strengthening the school. And when I left that school, kids opened doors for me. They said, thank you for that great presentation. Uh, teachers came up and shook my hand. And they, you know, when I first came into the school, it was probably the most unwelcoming place I've ever been. <laughs> so I think they really were trying to apply it. And so once yeah. people have one thing that they can apply, and that I didn't express it as soul enhancing at that point, I just said, think positive thoughts. This is bigger than that. This is thinking thoughts that really empower and and show that you you care about about people rather than allowing yourself to diminish yourself and them. So I think that that's that you will see an, a noticeable change in the workplace when that happens. Um, the other thing that you'll see a change when things start to move forward is you will start to see people being consulted from multiple standpoints and their voices being listened to and included. And if you don't see that, then there isn't justice. If you don't have justice, you don't have anything else. You don't move to unity. You don't move to abundance. You don't move to peace. So there is a virtue sequence in the book. That's the first thing you need is truth and love. So you have to be really interested in knowing the truth of a situation, not imposing your idea of the truth. What is the truth of the situation? What's really happening here? And how, how can I show love in this situation? And so what that's the foundation. When those two places, things are in place, the next thing is justice. It, you ha there has to be equity. You can't bring two people of unequal power into a room and sit them down and say, kiss and make up because one person is going to use it against the other person. It's unjust. And until you've established some equity, you can't move to unity. And the unity has to be unity in diversity. So it means that people can participate fully from, this, from who they are. And then uh, as they do that, they want to belong and they want to be part of the organization. So they will make some adjustments to what they're doing to ensure that they're promoting belonging. So it's okay. like this, this, this kind of dilemma 
uh, to belong, you have to be free to be yourself. To free to be yourself, you have to you have you have to also want to belong. Like it, they kind of work right, together, right, 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 together. And yeah. then after justice, unity. After unity, peace, and after peace, abundance. So if you go, oh, let's just spread out the wealth, and everything will be fine. Everything goes right back to the way it was, because Absolutely. the oppressed become the oppressor, and there was no truth, no love, no justice, no unity. So mm -hmm. that can be. Um, something that you use as a as a measurement okay wonderful how do people get the book uh book you on podcast because <laughs> you're just an amazing interview how do we follow up and, and and really be part of this this shift uh the spirit of work as well well you can get the book on pretty much all the online directories so i mean amazon and barnes and noble are the two that come to mind um and then locally you can purchase it purchase it in some bookstores but um it's basically if you don't live in my city it's best to just get it online it's in the e-version and it's also um as in book version and hopefully soon we will come out with an uh, audiobook version oh that would be awesome thank you so much marie for being on the show and setting a really good intention for this interview and i think absolutely just the connection that so many people feel when you have you on and they read up your work and they get to know you it's just really amazing so thanks for being with us thank you monica for your excellent questions you're truly you're truly outstanding in your craft thank you ma'am and thanks to all of you for joining us today and join us next time for the powerhouse woman show